I'm going to uh, spend a, a few minutes talking about uh, an open source or open resource technology, we call it, uh, that um, uh, we are using to find basically new genes from environmental genomes, from microbial communities. Okay, so this is uh, something called the Canadian Metamicrobiome Library Resource for Soil Metagenomics. And I apologize, well you say you should never uh, apologize in a talk, but uh, basically I'm going to try and give you an idea of what the science is behind what we are trying to do. Okay, so this is a collaboration with a number of individuals in biology at University of Waterloo and also Gabo moreno Hagelseeb at uh, Wilfrid Laurier. So the technology I'm going to talk to you about is something called metagenomics. So what's metagenomics? Basically, metagenomics is the ability to isolate DNA directly from environmental samples. So most environmental samples, such as soils, have very complex diversity. There's lots of organisms there. But probably more important, most of those organisms you can't cultivate. And traditionally, the way that you study microbes is you grow them in pure culture, a single strain in a culture. If most of them are uncultivatable, how do you actually access them? Well, what you can do is work at the DNA level. So you can isolate DNA directly from that environment. Doesn't matter what type of environment it is. It can be soil, it could be human fecal matter, which is really interesting. Um, it can be a, a, a biofilm in your drain, really anywhere. And that DNA, you can then cut up into pieces, clone it into vectors, and you can then determine the DNA sequence directly, or you can express the genes. So I'm gonna focus on this aspect here. You can express the genes directly in other organisms. Going backwards here. Okay, so there is a report from the uh, US National Academies that made this statement. And I don't think that it's really hyperbole. I think it's actually true. If not, it might be an understatement. And that is that the emerging field of metagenomics presents the greatest opportunity, perhaps since the invention of the microscope, to revolutionize understanding of the living world. Notice that this is not the understanding of the living microbial world, but understanding of the living world. And that's because microbes are everywhere and they're influencing all organisms, all environments, all ecosystems on Earth. So in order to tap this, we have developed something that we call open resource metagenomics. And the idea here is that we make metagenomic libraries. So these are basically those pieces of DNA that are cloned into plasmids, which can then replicate uh, in bacterial strains. And we make those available to other scientists. And the reason that we do this is that this is really, making these libraries here is really the bottleneck. Those are really, really difficult to make. They're challenging. You need a high level of technical expertise. But once those libraries are available, anybody can use them to find any type of gene that they would like in them. Okay, so this is basically what we do. We make metagenomic libraries from diverse environments, so lots of soils predominantly, but also other things. Um, we pool the clones, basically mix all the clones together. Uh, we freeze those away in freezers. Of course, we've got databases uh, that include all the metadata, so information about the physical and biological characteristics of the environment, where those samples are taken from, the DNA sequence information, so you know what types of organisms and what types of genes you might expect. And then we involve the community, scientific community, in actually obtaining the samples and also uh, in screening the libraries for different functions. So if any of you here are interested in becoming involved in either making libraries or obtaining libraries, uh, please come and see us. Okay, so here's some of the environments where we get these samples. So these are representative Canadian soils. And so we've got, you know, Arctic tundra, we've got compost in Cambridge, municipal compost, we've got swamps, 
Uh, we've got lots of agricultural soils. We even have, uh, this is a, a no-no I found out. It's not tar sand, it's oil sand. Um, <laughs> But uh, we have lots of interesting uh, microbial communities here. So basically, we've got a collection of different communities. And these different communities have different genetic structures. They have different organisms in them. And those organisms have different enzymes that can carry out different types of biological processes. And you can see that these are from different parts of the country. Uh, the community involvement was really important here because we didn't have to go to these places uh, to isolate these samples. Researchers who spend a lot of time in these environments were very good about uh, very quickly uh, sending us their samples or sending us samples that we asked for. Okay? So this is a, a good example of how you can get the community involved uh, very effectively. <laughs> Translation from Mac to PC problems. Um, but this isn't important for you to know anyway, even if you could translate that. Um, this is basically the DNA vector that we clone uh, the DNA into, uh, the DNA from the environmental samples. And it has a lot of interesting properties, but probably the properties are not very important for you here, so I'll just skip this slide. Um, so basically, we take this DNA, we randomly share it, so we get very, very large fragments of DNA, and this is important because we want to uh, clone uh, large segments of genomes that have all of the contiguous genes uh, for a certain region of the genome, all in single fragments. Uh, we end repair, make sure that it's nicely ready to clone into these vectors, and these vectors uh, can then be introduced into E. coli, and then we collect them and we freeze them in the, in the freezer. Okay? Once they're frozen in the freezer, then they're available really for any downstream process. And then here is an example of some of the libraries that we made. Okay? So most of these are the different soils, but then we also have one that's human gut. This is basically fecal samples that we call the Charles Lab gut microbiome. <laughs> It's a mixture of fecal samples from six or seven members of my lab. Um, and we have a large number of clones. So I'll highlight the best one here. This is nine million clones all in one sample. And that's the equivalent of about 77,000 microbial genomes. Large number of, uh, of genomes represented in here, a large number of genes. Okay, so what our standard methodology is, I'll just quickly go through this. We basically screen, we develop screens to identify positive clones for whichever screen we're interested in. We transfer the clones back to E. coli. Uh, we do all the genetic manipulations. We extract the DNA. We determine the DNA sequence. And we identify what the actual gene that is responsible for the phenotype we screened for is. Okay, so the first example I'm going to go through. I'm only going to give you two examples, maybe only one if I run out of time. Uh, but we all know that there's a problem with non-biodegradable plastics in the environment. And these are the other problem with non-biodegradable plastics is that they're made from fossil fuels. Okay? Um, this is not sustainable. So how do you get around this? Well, fortunately, microbes, bacteria in particular, make their own bioplastics. They have these polyhydroxyalkanoids that they produce. And these polyhydroxyalkanoids are produced through a known biochemical pathway, and we know all of the genes that are present in those pathways, that are controlling those pathways. This is one of the most important enzymes, PHB synthase or PHA synthase. And it determines what the final structure of that product is. Well, what we can do is we can screen our libraries for genetic complementation, so replacement of a PHB or PHA synthase mutant. And here's the PHA synthase mutant, which doesn't make those bioplastics inside them. And here is one that contains a metagenomic clone and it does contain. And if you look at the sequence identity, it's actually not that close to known PHA synthases. So here you can identify PHA synthases that are from novel organisms. 
Um, we can also do this selection in other organisms that have a, a wider um, uh, substrate specificity. So this is Pseudomonas putida, and we have this fluorescent screening method uh, that allows you to identify positive clones. Okay, so that's that example. And you isolate both class two, which are able to take in a large uh, diversity of substrate to make novel uh, bioplastics, and also the more common <coughs> class ones. The next example I'll quickly go through is glycoside hydrolases. So these are enzymes that hydrolyze glycosidic bonds between carbohydrates, and there's an identification system that uh, characterizes and uh, catalogs all the different uh, members of these. And some examples that are in general use in the biotech and industrial uh, and, and different industries would be cellulases, xylanases, pectinases, and amylases. And, and uh, enzyme companies are always on the lookout for novel enzymes, novel glycoside hydrolase enzymes. So we'll start with a very common one, beta-galactosidase. This is found in these uh, um, groups, glycoside hydrolase groups. This is one of the most commonly known enzymes, but it turns out we actually don't know very much about the enzyme. If you screen for novel beta-galactosidases in E. coli or in this other organism, Basically, uh, what we found when we sequenced the clones is that there were no obvious beta-galactosidase genes detected, indicating that the activity was from completely novel genes. And when you look at the sequence and you characterize the protein motifs, you find that although the biochemical activities indicate they were real beta-galactosidases, they were not annotated as beta-galactosidases. So this one, for example, is a diguanolate cyclase. Uh, the organisms are uh, interesting groups, things like brucomicrobia, which are not uh, very commonly used or, or used at all, um, uh, biotech organisms. So we have, for example, diguanolate cyclase, which has nothing to do with a glycoside hydrolase. We have dehydrogenase. Again, nothing to do with a, a glycoside hydrolase. And then we have this one, which is basically conserved hypothetical. We have no idea what it is. Okay, so final points. Functional metagenomics facilitates the isolation of genes that could not be predicted based on DNA sequence. Novel genes are available for use in biotech applications. And this open resource metagenomics makes high quality metagenomic libraries available to all. And those are the people who did the work. Thank you.